Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you to the uh, Mexico Oil and Gas Review for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm very honored to moderate this panel with uh, all these uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, as Faye mentioned, we have uh, the presence of uh, three general directors for uh, oil and gas companies uh, here in Mexico today. Evelyn representing uh, Chevron, Monica representing Equinor, uh, Sergio uh, at the end representing Repsol, and we also have uh, with us in the panel uh, Eric uh, representing uh, TGS. So definitely deep water is uh, an important component of uh, the energy reform. 25% uh, of the blocks awarded to date uh, come from deep water. Uh, it's uh, exactly 27 blocks. Uh, the ambition for Mexico in terms of uh, deep water uh, production uh, by 2030 is to be producing 300,000 barrels, which is a big ambition. That is 10% of the production of the country by that year. And that would be 2.5% of the worldwide deep water production. And when we say deep water, we are talking here production that comes from more than 500 meters of water depth. So the ambition is big. Uh, the expectation is that the resources are there, but also this brings uh, a lot of uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and risks uh, to, to this ambition. And that's it, that is what we are planning to discuss uh, in this panel. So without uh, more preamble, I would like to uh, start asking a, a few questions and uh, having the, 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 the panelists uh, to share their opinions and their ideas on, on these topics. Towards the end, we're gonna take uh, 10 minutes also to uh, answer uh, some of the questions that will come from, from the audience. So uh, I think it's important uh, to start the panel to put things in context. And I think it's important to talk about the global deep water uh, uh, environment today and the competitive landscape. Uh, Mexico is not uh, alone competing for uh, capital. And uh, I would like to hear the opinion of the panelists uh, on this topic. And we will start with uh, Evelyn. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. It is an honor for me to be here. It's an honor for me to chair the panel with my colleagues. Um, for, for Chevron, deep water is a, a big, significant part of our portfolio. Uh, during the last few years, uh, deep water development had a, a tough time, uh, but the industry has uh, found ways to overcome uh, the impact of the downturn on the oil prices and the uh, increased competition from um, unconventional investment. Uh, to, to be more efficient uh, with the cost, the industry uh, found new technologies and um, worked to uh, get uh, a standard designs that allowed uh, uh, newer developments to be competitive. Um, in, in, in the last few years, uh, Chevron has been successful uh, with uh, deep water exploration, and we expect to continue being competitive and making it an even larger part of our um, portfolio. Thank you, Jesus. Monica, go ahead. Yes. And uh, thanks to the organizer for the in um, invitation to the panelists. Uh, to answer your question, Jesus, um, as you mentioned, there's a significant resource potential in Mexico, and, and we see that as a very exciting part, and we're very happy to be here. We have two deep water blocks in Salinas Sureste, together with our partners BP and Total, 
and we are progressing the, uh, these. I'm very happy to have the exploration plan approved in March. But as you say, it's important to remember that Mexico and deep water competes for capital, as Evelyn said, uh, also with projects on unconventionals and other type of, of projects. But also when we go to our management to ask for capital to invest in Mexico, they will ask us, okay, so how does this compare with the bid round in Brazil, with the bid round on the Norwegian shelf? with the one in Peru, in Argentina, in the US, in West Africa. Uh, so it's very important that Mexico continues to offer uh, a model that is a win-win model uh, that competes globally um, so that uh, Mexico can attract that capital investment to deep water, which as you say, is a, it's a potentially very prolific, but also a, a high-risk game from a geological point of view, since uh, these plays are untested. Thank you, Monica. Eric? Thank you, Jesus, and thank you to the organizers also for having TGS on the panel. Um, yeah, I would say my comments may be uh, in, in a general context. Um, I think it's clear that deep water exploration development has become very competitive again, um, even with lower prices than at the peak. Um, through the efficiency gains that the oil companies have, have found and through cost cutting that came through the, the downturn. So I think um, that deep water can actually compete uh, effectively and serve as a portfolio balance to unconventionals, which have taken up so much of, of the, the, the oil company's capital recently. I think most companies now, oil companies, uh, will say that they can have uh, break-evens on their projects in deep water or their successful projects of $40 or less. But that said, as, as has been said by Monica and Evelyn, uh, deep water is, exploration is a global game. Um, the oil companies are constantly looking for the most prolific basins globally and the best terms and the best political climates and they will move their capital, and we will follow them uh, as a service company to the, to the high-graded areas and countries and basins. So the way we see this as a service company, we see ourselves as part of an ecosystem together with the oil companies and the regulators in the countries. We are um, guided by the oil companies where they would like to invest their money, and we go out and enable them by providing high-quality data on time and on budget. In turn, uh, ideally, the regulators will enable both the oil, oil companies and the service companies with transparent and compact regulations, uh, which will incentivize us to invest. So this creates what I would call a well-functioning, uh, ideal ecosystem. Um, Mexico, I would say, in the last years through the energy reform has been a competitive and attractive ecosystem to work in um, and ex attracted significant exploration capital. Thank you, Eric. Sergio, please go ahead. <clears throat> well, I, I also wanted to thank the organizers and, and colleagues here in the panel for this opportunity. Uh, as has been said, um, this is a, a global market uh, for exploration in, in deep water and. Uh, we are excited that uh, Mexico has uh, provided, has granted these opportunities that um, we see as projects that are in, a, in, a, in one of our geographical core areas as Latin America. And um, uh, we, we, be, we also believe that the resources should be there. And, um, and this is an, um, a basin that on, on the Mexican side, it's, as it's, it's a new frontier. It's, hasn't been explored, but um, it's next to, to an area that has been producing in deep water for, for many years now. Uh, we feel that, that the, the potential is there and that uh, we will be able to conduct operations in Mexico under the, the framework that exists and uh, that, that will allow us to, to gain all the information needed during uh, the exploration of these projects. All right, very good. So I heard the word competitiveness a few times. 
So uh, in your opinion, what are the main variables that define the competitiveness of the Mexican deep water blocks in the global portfolios of your companies or for an IOC company? Monica, can you go ahead, please? Thank you, Jesus. Um, there are several variables that will define the competitiveness of a specific opportunity in our portfolio. And it's uh, always a holistic view of uh, the opportunity and risk. And of course, we start with the subsurface. You know, we have to believe that there's oil and gas to be found. And uh, we believe that uh, Mexico has a great potential, uh, but as I said previously, it's untested. Um, and we have to be aware that in deep water, the chance of success in your well is maybe one to two out of 10 wells, which are expensive wells, will have a, a discovery. And then you start to talk about, is it a technical discovery or a commercial discovery? So the first variable is, is the subsurface and the attractiveness of that. And then of course, the fiscal regime, uh, the regulations uh, to have certainty when you are investing for potentially 40 to 50 years, you know to want, uh, you, you want to know which basis you are investing on and that you can count on that so you can make your calculations. Um, and I think that Mexico has come to a very good model where you have a win-win situation where companies can come in with their capital, with our uh, technology. I think we have a lot to bring in terms of project management, uh, cutting edge technology, etc., cetera, um, and, and share risk with other uh, companies and partners. And uh, on the one side, and then on the other side, uh, a win-win also for the government in terms of having progressive contracts, getting uh, investments into the countries, getting taxes, royalties, etc., and not having to take any risk in that deep water uh, exploration. Um, so until now, as we've seen in the bid rounds, the Mexican deep water has been competitive with other opportunities. And I think it's very important for all the companies that we see a continued access to such opportunities. Because if you're only going to drill one well and then another one in four years, then you don't get enough synergies to actually have a portfolio. And that's not good for the Mexican value chain either. So we hope to see a continued access to such opportunities so that we can have a portfolio in the country. Thank you. Eric? Well, as uh, with Monica, I would start with the subsurface. Um, and if you permit me, uh, I would say from the IOC what I think the IOCs are looking for, because as a service company, we're very, very interested in that. Um, but I would say pro prolific hydrocarbon systems is the first thing, really a variation of what Monica was saying. Um, particularly uh, great hydrocarbon source systems and following on with the other main factors of reservoir and, and traps. Um, these go together to make what I think, again, the ILCs will be looking for that make Mexico deep water competitive would be high volume prospects, large hydrocarbon volumes with moderate to low risk. Monica is talking about high risk, but I think it's, that's an open question. <laughs> um, but that would be the, the attractive factor. And of course, again, good fiscal terms that give a good return on the risk that you take. And again, I think Mexico is, is there. Um, again, what you would be looking for as an IOC, I think would be able to achieve break-evens of around $40 per barrel on your, on your good pro uh, projects. And both the IOCs and the service companies, I think, would very much like to see regular, transparent, and well-timed licensing rounds, again, as Monica said. And I'd finish up by just saying, I think, as has been since the opening and the reform, um, the tantalizing factor with the Mexican deep water is the clear geologic analogy to the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. There are differences, but there's enough similarities that when you look at, obviously, the U.S. GOM deep water with something like 1,200 and more uh, deep water exploration wells that have proved 
up to 25 billion barrels of, of oil, and the Mexican deep water side with uh, using a, a definition of four or 500 meters of water, maybe 50, 40 wells, uh, that huge difference indicates there is clearly a very tantalizing upside to exploring the Mexican deep water. Um, now we just need to get drilling those prospects. Thank you, Eric. Sergio? Well, I, I follow up on what my colleagues are saying here, and I, and I think uh, these are explore deep water exploration projects, and the, and the main variable here will always be the, the geology and that we get it right. Uh, I also agree that you, know, you need a constant feeding of, of projects in order to be able to understand that geology and the whole uh, Mexican um, context on, 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 on deep water. So those are the two things that are, I, I think will define the competitiveness of, of, of Mexico. All right, thank you, Sergio. Evelyn? The only thing I, I believe I, I would like to add is that in the future, uh, after discoveries are made, uh, the competitiveness will also include infrastructure. Availability of infrastructure will be key. Uh, there is currently, uh, there has not been development for deep water. So uh, the evaluations uh, of uh, uh, deep water prospects have to be done on standalone basis. Uh, in the future, with the development of deep water projects, the infrastructure will come, and uh, we will uh, start probably thinking about hubs for development, which will make uh, uh, deep water projects more competitive in terms of cost or in terms of savings because of sharing of infrastructure. Yes, Monica. Um, I just would like to add one point. Um, as I think we all agreed here, Mexico has found a good model, uh, but there's always time to kind of revise and see uh, if there's improvements to be made. And if there's one thing that we think was a mistake of the reform and that we have been communicating also to the government the last three years is that in we believe that in order to increase production and Mexican production, what you need is activity. You need exploration activity. When you look at the, uh, the probabilities of making a discovery, you realize that you need dozens and dozens and dozens of wells. Uh, probably 20 to 30 uh, offshore wildcat wells per year and as many appraisal wells. And with uh, the bidding variables that have been in Mexico, where you have had such large focus on the additional royalty, which is addition to the base and the, all of the taxes, instead of on um, incentivizing activity, um, I think that's something that could be revised and where you could get more activity, more investments that also would have positive effects in the value chain and in the end, increase the probability of having more discoveries and monetizing those resources for the Mexican state. Uh, and the other one is, I also think there's a large opportunity when it comes to developing the domestic gas market. Can you have incentives for companies to develop also gas from deep waters, which is currently not economic, so that uh, you could also uh, monetize these resources, and as Evelyn said, the infrastructure and having the government orchestrate infrastructure so you can actually evacuate that gas. Thank you very much, Monica. Yes, Eric, go ahead. Just to follow up, I just wanted to put two lines under Monica's uh, statement there about incentivizing exploration activity. I think if you back calculate the objectives of the Mexican government to production levels, and, and look at what you actually have to do to achieve that, uh, then you really need to go where, where Monica is indicating in terms of, of stimulating much more activity, even though it has, as I said, been a good five years uh, since the reform. Uh, I think it, to, to achieve the results that you would like, I think it has to go, in fact, even, even faster. Yeah, no, thank you, Eric, and I cannot agree more with you, Monica, that the, 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 a key factor here is the, the increase of activity 
and uh, you know you have exploration activity going on and uh, appraisal activity going on and development activity going on and kind of one on top of each other creating that volume that is very much required for for the industry so yes so um, before going into uh, because I want to touch upon activity later on but um, there are external factors to, to the industry or even to your companies that can, uh, can pose uh, a, a risk to, to, to this activity and to the, the future investments. And you know, when I say factors, I can mention uh, uh, national policy, uh, regulation framework, uh, oil price. So uh, uh, what is your point of view of the main risks that they, they may come from external factors in your, in your future plans. And uh, I would let's start with Sergio uh, on, this, uh, on this point. Well, uh, you know, in deep water exploration, I think one of the main ones is um, oil prices. No? We're starting to come down from, um, from a downturn cycles on, on, on prices, and, and, and I think it's a good moment to start, uh, as we've been doing, to start planning on this, this type of projects, uh, and, and we hope uh, we can continue this trend in, in the future years. Um, I will also mention, um, you know, uh, as we mentioned on the first um, issue of, of, of first question that we discussed, if there is a increased competitions from, from other uh, basins and other parts of the world, that investment um, will, will have to, to be decided on, on where to go. No? Um, also, uh, you know, these are long-term projects, so talking about regulations, you know, stability on the framework that we have is, is, is key on being able to plan and, and, and continue in investments and, and activities in, in these projects. Thank you, Sergio. Evelyn? Um, uh, I, I, uh, I believe, and uh, I believe I talked on, on, on behalf of the whole industry, uh, keeping the pace of the uh, opportunities to participate in bid rounds and uh, uh, a stable regulatory framework are key. Uh, uh, in the future, uh, a streamlining of the uh, regulatory processes and uh, uh, more simple uh, administrative uh, process uh, will also help. Uh, but uh, one thing that I, I want to emphasize is uh, the main risk is geological. And uh, above the ground risk are uh, always going to be, and they are going to change from time to time. So, Thank you, Evelyn. Monica? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the important factors have, have been mentioned. Geological, obviously. Oil price, um, as was mentioned, we have come down a lot, we have worked a lot as companies to simplify, to standardize, to industrialize our processes, to be fit at oil prices at $40. And as we talked about earlier, deep water is now able to compete with other types of opportunities. Um, but uh, also as Evelyn said, what we look for everywhere where we invest is certainty for our investments so we can take that risk and uh, we think we have a lot to contribute with, uh, with the experience that we bring. Uh, we have a lot of knowledge from other basins, other places that we can bring to Mexico, technology. And of course, uh, we would like certainty and to keep investing, to grow our portfolio and see that uh, there's a possibility to do that. And then I think simplification is a key word. Um, the, the current system, as we said, has been a great first step. Uh, but the reporting requirements uh, are very uh, cumbersome. Now, to do monthly reporting on how we progress on um, maturing our deep water blocks, which we might drill end of 2019, early 2020, we are having two to three geologists to do that reporting, and they should be spending their time on looking at where we want to drill that well. We don't have anything against reporting, but it should be timely. And you know, instead of having monthly reporting, could you do annual reporting, etc. So I think there's a huge opportunity to simplify the system 
for, to, the, to the best for the government, for Mexico, and, and also for the companies, because that means we can focus on the right thing, which is to find and produce oil and gas and help increase the production of, of Mexico and monetize the resources for Mexico. Very good. Thank you, Monica. So, Eric, uh, from your perspective of the, of the service company, uh, where do you see these risks? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, well, I, I think, you know, you mentioned a number of them, and I think we could probably do an entire seminar on each factor. So uh, I, I kind of thought about it in a more of a, a general sense, but each, I mean, all of the factors would definitely impact development timelines. Um, and again, if we want to accelerate the value creation from the Mexican deep water potential resources, you would encourage, I think we would all encourage the Mexican authorities to optimize all of the factors that they have control over. Um, and I would come back to this concept of the supplier oil company regulator ecosystem to make sure that that functions, to make sure that, as, as has been said, that uh, um, reporting, um, regulations, et cetera, are, are as compact and streamlined as possible. Um, anybody that has calculated and worked with um, deep water projects knows that you, you generally will use the net present value. And delays will destroy and erode the net present value. So everything we can do to avoid delays, to in fact accelerate to first oil, increases the value of the resources. Thank you, Eric. So coming back to the activity uh, discussion, uh, in order to, for this activity increase to be properly supported, we will need the local value chain, uh, the Mexican companies, what the Subsecretary uh, Garza mentioned, uh, to, to, to step up and to be ready for this big challenge that deep water represents. Today, we could say that we have uh, a local value chain used to work in uh, land projects and in shelf or shallow water projects, but the demand that the deep water projects is going to, to bring uh, is going to be big and it's going to be different. So from your perspectives in, 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 in your companies, uh, how, how do you see or what is required from the local value chain in order to be ready for what is coming? And let me start uh, with you, Evelyn. Thank you, Mr. Um, well, we, we, we all know that uh, uh, the, the uh, suppliers in Mexico have been working for 70 years or more. Uh, you said it in land or in shallow waters. Deep water will require a step up, a step up not only uh, on the different companies that will be demanding the requirements, but the companies in Mexico will need to step up uh, on safety standards and operational excellence. Um, we need a competitive uh, local supply chain that will need to be developed. But um, you, you also say uh, in your initial comment that we needed uh, that to start immediately, and I agree. This step up process needs to start immediately, but I would like to uh, make a very big statement for me. Uh, deep water is long term. Uh, we are only starting the exploration phase. Deep water development will probably take uh, 10 years or more after significant discoveries, discoveries are made. So we have time for that development of the supply chain. Uh, Chevron in particular has, has done it in other countries. We work hand on hand with local suppliers and uh, help them understand our needs and work with them to move up on that uh, uh, standards or on the requirements so that these local uh, suppliers uh, can be part of our projects. 
Thank you, Evelyn. Monica? Yes, there's been mentioned there's a lot of expertise already in, in Mexico. And uh, as we said, you know, um, there are different numbers, but deep water wells in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico are around maybe 4,000, while here there are 40 to 50. So there's a still a lot to do in Mexico and also for the Mexican value chain to then to develop that capacity. Um, and as Evelyn said, you know, safety is our main priority. So making sure that you have top standards in terms of HSE is uh, key. It's the job of everyone in this panel and everyone in this room to make sure that our people get safely back from work to their families. Uh, so that should be kind of the baseline for everything. And along with that goes, of course, very transparent uh, operations, which is what we all work uh, to get. And then uh, the technology development. We are in a technology-driven industry. So uh, collaborating with uh, other companies to, uh, to develop more technology, to make sure you have the standards that you socialize yourself or, or that the local value chain socialize themselves with the standards that each of the uh, new players require. And there are going to be different standards. Uh, that's that's very important. And then what can we do, all of us, in terms of digitalization, automatization? You know, we are looking at can we have unmanned platforms that will make our CO2 fit footprint lower, make the activities more efficient, safer? Uh, could we have subsea drones? Uh, you know, uh, could we uh, automatize reporting? Uh, could we have, you know, an Uber uh, service for rigs? Uh, there are so much untapped potential in digitalization, technology, and automatization. And I, you know, that's the future, and that's where Mexico also uh, needs to be. Um, also with a focus on how can we produce oil and gas in a cleaner way with lower CO2 emissions. Thank you, Monica. I like your Uber <laughs> <laughs> to take things to the rigs uh, idea. Uh, Eric, <laughs> please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, yesterday uh, in the session, uh, the opening speech given by Commissioner Zepeda, I thought he gave a very good review of the hydrocarbon um, industry's value chain. Um, and he actually uh, talked about seismic, and, and he did put weight on the importance of seismic data early in the process to define the drilling targets that we're talking about uh, in an accurate manner. Um, we've Evelyn's mentioned 10 years as kind of a deep water standard from discovery to first oil. Well, even before that, there's the, the early part of the, the timeline and the uh, value chain where a seismic project from when the geologist first tells his manager or uh, her, her manager that they would like seismic, that can go easily two years for a 3D deep water data set. Um, you know, planning, uh, permitting, uh, acquisition, processing, all of this until the geologist is sitting with this data, uh, planning a well, or actually working up where the well should be. So from our perspective, we, being again very specific around regulations, I think to facilitate the early step uh, that the commissioner talked about, I would say three things. Again. Uh, a compact, unbureaucratic un permitting process for seismic and other types of, of data. Again, regularly timed expiration rounds that we know when they're going to come, that they come when they, sa they say, and that we know where they're going to be. And finally, the a fiscal regime that not only incentivizes the oil companies, but also the suppliers um, to do the data acquisition uh, and invest the money that we need to invest. Thank you, Eric. Sergio? Well, at, you know, as has been mentioned, Mexico has a base of, of uh, a value chain based on, on services and, and providers that, that makes kind of unique because this is a, an opening of, an, of a new frontier on deep water exploration, but in a country that already has a base, although, as mentioned, not specialized in deep water, I think it's a good base to to start in time to develop uh, what we will need in, in our operations.
application. So, so I think that that's, that's a good start point uh, for, for operations in Mexico. Uh, there is also um, an, an issue of, of our providers in, in country to adapt uh, of the way the market was with one client to all the, cl all the clients that you are going to have in the future years here and how all those resources can be made available to all of our needs. And that, that's something that we see and try to understand um, and manage on, on how we are going to be able to conduct all those operations efficiently and on time um, uh, with all the competitiveness that we're going to have here in the next uh, few years. Thank you, Sergio. So we cannot have a panel about deep water and not talk about technology. Okay, and uh, of course, deep water involves uh, significant technological challenges. And I would like to hear uh, your perspective on how your international expertise uh, can be a, a, a game changer and can contribute to the, we could say, tight deadlines that the, the CNH and the country in general has for, uh, for these developments to, to or to start production from these developments. So let us know a little bit about the, the technology in your company. Monica. Thank you. Uh, as we have talked about, Mexico provides a, a large, geologically diverse and, and, and complex setting. And uh, I think what we can do, IOCs, independents, uh, Mexican companies, uh, and, and uh, us as Equinor, previously Statoil, is that we bring a wealth of uh, geological and technolo uh, technological knowledge and experience. We have worked with a range of basins and plate types uh, all over the world. We are currently in 35 countries, so that means that our geologists, our um, technical people, can compare across basins. They can see new models that have been untested in Mexico before. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Norwegian uh, citizen, and what we've seen in Norway is that the collaboration and having 50 companies on the Norwegian shelf has really helped us extract the potential of the shelf, and it continues to do that because you have different set of eyes that can come with different ideas and test those ideas and in that way you develop much more of the potential than you, you would with only one or a few, few players. So I think this experience in having tested plays and, and uh, having a lot of experience from other basins is something that uh, we bring with us to Mexico and then also in terms of uh, technology, uh, how we can uh, drill safely on, on depths that are this, this deep uh, is, uh, is another uh, part. And then when you, you get into the production stage, as we said, in over a decade, then uh, we have a lot of experience when it comes to uh, the development of, of these fields and also in terms of increasing recovery and um, and uh, also we are working on technology development in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, can we have unmanned platforms to uh, operate safely, uh, more efficiently, and, and with cheaper costs. And there's a range of other technology developments that we can bring to Mexico. Thank you, Monica. Eric, your perspective? Okay. Um, I think what I would, would, would do to answer that is, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the technical challenges? I would connect two non-seismic challenges, as I see them, uh, with the deep water to, to seismic. And uh, again, I had uh, previously talked about the deep water Gulf of Mexico on the U.S. side, which uh, when you look at the, the maps uh, that go across of, of infrastructure, it's an incredibly dense uh, set of pipelines, platforms, and infrastructure to support the business, and it's the opposite for the Mexican deep water. You also have uh, the drilling that will be done in deep water and even ultra deep water into unknown reservoirs and pressures. So these are two very big challenges for the Mexican exploration. So at the same time, I think what you may have begun to have seen are that well, what we do need 
to be able to support continue or to create uh, economic prospects and to continue to, to, to work in Mexico then would be uh, large volumes, as I uh, previously said, prospects that contain large volumes. So the challenge on the seismic side will be to be able to define accurately those prospects that have the volumes that can give the NPVs uh, given these infrastructure challenges. Um, so we see in collaboration with the oil companies that we will be working on uh, taking technology that's, that's been developed on the Gulf of on the US side on, on high-end seismic imaging, working with amplitudes and the attributes of the seismic to try and uh, define the best, high, highest prob probability aspects. And is this cutting out? Okay. And uh, Monica said uh, the analogs from around the world into understanding what you have on the, uh, on the Mexican side. And finally, um, potentially, as we go forward, using the new coming and coming techniques of machine learning and artificial intelligence to bring together all the possible types of data, uh, both from the US and Mexican sides and from around the world to define uh, and guide the drilling of the best prospects. Thank you, Eric. Sergio? Uh, <clears throat> as, you know, uh, as, as mentioned before, um, the key here is understanding the, the geology and the geoscience of these projects. And uh, I think we at Repsol, that's uh, our, our, our um, first uh, and, and most important um, task in all these projects. We, we, we have the internal capabilities to try to process, evaluate all this, uh, all this information that is available and that we will gain through the projects on, on, on the on the G and G uh, aspects of, of of the Mexican basins, um, we we have experience uh, in 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 many other basins that will complement what what we will learn and what, what we will use to to try to uh, to achieve success in 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 Mexico. So for us, we we have uh, um, two uh, G and G hubs in our companies that work together on all our deep water and, and all exploration projects, and that's something that we will bring an, a, an, a, in Mexico for all the activities that, that we are planning to, to carry on. All right, thank you, Sergio. Evelyn? Yeah, so uh, just to, I, I believe, summarize what has already been said, uh, deep water uh, drilling is uh, one of the most challenging, challenging uh, ways to find and develop oil. We all recognize that. Uh, but uh, I know that we will find ways to overcome the, techn the technical challenges as uh, our companies and the industry have partnered together and found technical ways to overcome challenges in other areas of the uh, globe. Uh, we have experience and we have been successful uh, for many years so we will bring that success uh, and that expertise to Mexico we'll find the ways to overcome the technological challenges uh, and as Sergio said first step get the big discoveries okay. thank you so as expected with this uh, great panelist we are getting flooded by questions uh, before we go into some of these questions, uh, I would like to kind of summarize uh, some of the, of the things that I heard during the panel. So number one, I would say deep water is here, but it's a long-term journey. This is not a two-year or a five-year venture. Uh, we heard that uh, in the most optimistic scenario, first oil is 10 years out, and probably if we put it more realistic, is more of a 15, 10 to 15 year uh, uh, term uh, that we will need to develop and, and, and have that uh, production coming out. The second thing I heard and, uh, is uh, stability is a critical factor and uh, it's a critical factor to keep Mexico as a competitive uh, deep water province. Uh, that will be uh, very, very important. 
uh, for all the service companies in the room, I think uh, it's very important uh, what the panelists mentioned about the opportunities will be there for those who are ready. So if we are not ready today, this is the time to start and be ready for the challenges that deep water exploration, appraisal and development will bring uh, to, to, to our companies. And the other thing that uh, I think is obvious uh, and very important is innovation. I, I heard a few times digital, le machine learning, artificial intelligence, unmanned platforms. So uh, our industry, not only Mexico, is going to change dramatically in the, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And it's important that Mexico remains uh, attractive so all this technology can come and help uh, develop these uh, deep water resources. So I will go now with, uh, with a few questions coming from the panel. Uh, I will read out the question and please uh, let me know who wants to take it and, uh, or if there are uh, uh, several panelists that would want to comment. So I have a question here from Javier Mundo, CNH, and the question is, how can the IOC help in the development of Mexico's national industry through technology transfer? Are there any plans? Monica? I can take that. Uh, I think we've touched upon some of the, the uh, topics already. Uh, in our license contracts that we have to for deep water, um, technology transfer is one of the five components to comply with your uh, local content. But I think even so, uh, we, with or without local content targets, what we want is to develop a national industry that could help us uh, uh, develop our projects. And uh, as we have mentioned, there can be various forms of collaborations uh, with universities, uh, helping suppliers to get to know our standards to develop um, as the, the undersecretary was talking about, how do you lift uh, companies from the one quadrant to another? Uh, and that's something we have been do doing in Brazil, uh, for example, and that we could also do in Mexico. Um, and uh, also in terms of, of technology transfer, we have talked about uh, how we drill more efficiently um, in terms of processes uh, that could be transferred and also uh, in terms of uh, what we have been doing now the last year is the environmental baseline study where we have been collecting samples uh, from, um, from deep water soil which have never been collected before. So I think there's a great potential. You can reshare that with universities, students can, can study these, etc. Um, so there's various uh, ways we can do that um, and we will, as we progress these projects, we will start to see these uh, materializing. Thank you, Monica. Sergio, you mm -hmm. want to comment? Yeah, so fo following up on, on what Monica is saying, um, technology transfer could be many things and, 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 and it will happen as, as we progress in these projects, but we, we also see it as a, as a knowledge transfer, as a, as a collaboration with society in the countries where we are, in this case in Mexico, not only with the government, with, with academy and, and, and you know, use, you know, taking advantage of our expertise in, in, in many different projects and collaborating with universities, with the students, with professors and, 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 and with uh, research uh, projects and, and, and all the like. I think that that is something where, where the technology transfer will probably uh, be focused, at, at least on our uh, point of view, on, on, on the beginning of these projects. Um, later on, if, if we are successful and, 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 and these projects become developments, there, there will be other means and other ways. But I think that the transfer of knowledge is, is, is a very good way to start. Thank you, Sergio. Anybody else? So we have another question here uh, from Jaime, Subi Jaime Subillaga, uh, Managing Director of Man Energy Solutions. And the question is, uh, when, uh, preferably if we can mention the year, are you going to be ready to evaluate the main capital equipment required 
for production. So, uh, I would like to take a stab at that one. Go ahead, uh, Evelyn. So, uh, uh, deep water development, as you all probably know, uh, and as we have said in the panel, is long term. Uh, in this initial phase, we're in an exploratory mode. Um, and so we will drill a few wells for each block, go back to our desktops, reprocess the information and evaluate the information we've gotten from the uh, subsurface, evaluate, make a decision to continue drilling or uh, step up and evaluate and appraise what we have found. And not only until we have a commercial discovery, which means that it's not only we have a discovery of hydrocarbons that is technically viable, but also of the size that makes the development economic, uh, we will be able to start thinking on development. And I, hello. And I think that's when uh, that will happen. Uh, that's when we will start uh, thinking on uh, the development of those uh, potential fields. But uh, right now, it's a first exploration. Uh, you have one or two wells, uh, people with expertise uh, from other uh, uh, from from deep water technical qualified drillers will come, they will drill, they will go back to drill some other place. Uh, we will evaluate that information. We will then maybe appraise. And then after we have the commercial discovery, we will start thinking on developing. Monica? I just add that I would love to be in the position of having that commercial discovery and uh, being able to answer that question. But as, as um, Evelyn says, there's a lot of step that needs to happen before that. And when we have that commercial uh, discovery, we have a two-year period to have a development plan. And in, in that period, internally, we'll go through, okay, what are the concept solutions for this? How will we develop it? You know, FTSO or other... Um, you know, can we, or can we tie it back to another, you know, great project out there? Um, and once you have that concept defined, that is when you start to procure for, for the services. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking very much forward to that day when, when uh, we start that part of, of the journey. So Jaime, stay tuned. It's coming, but... <laughs> Okay, so we have another question here from uh, El Señor Rafael Bracho, the Emerson, uh, and it's related to automation. And he wants to have a general idea of how much is the percentage of, uh, of the total capex that a, a typical deep water project invests in automation. You may or may not know that from the top, top of your heads, but uh, any ballpark numbers? I have to say I don't know what the percentage is, but it's going to increase uh, and and it's rapidly uh, evolving. And uh, you know, as as Alex said, from the collection of data to understanding the immense uh, uh, vari variety of data we have to collecting data from the wells, etc., it's only going to increase, and it's going to be more and more important for the industry as a whole to be competitive. Eric. Yeah, I, I don't know the percentages or the amount of money, um, but from my previous life, uh, where I was with uh, Monica in, in Equinord, um, I know that Equinord, and I know through working with other oil companies, that every oil company, every major oil company is working on uh, automation, fiercely working on, on, on using the new techniques that are coming. Uh, to, to optimize, to reduce costs, to reduce uh, human exposure to unsafe environments, etc. So, hard to quantify, but I think it's actually a very big number, uh, and, and it's just going to be increasing uh, exponentially, I think, uh, going forward. Well, I Evelyn? 
I will take it as a homework. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sure uh, we have ways to have a very good answer for him. Uh, I don't have that knowledge with me, but I have a huge team that uh, will be able to give you a much better answer. So if after the, uh, the, the talk, we can exchange cards and I will be very happy to provide you a much better answer. We'll get back to you, Ralph. <laughs> okay, so there is another question specifically uh, for Monica and Evelyn. And it's Wilson Lopez from uh, the Business Development Manager for QGOG Constellation. And uh, he, he, he asks, referring to the need to build infrastructure to support deep water, would you be able, do, would you be more specific on what type of infrastructure is required? Should this gap be closed by private or government efforts? Why? Um, so the way I see it, uh, infrastructure will be needed for uh, production processing and uh, management of production when we do the development. So we're talking about uh, FPSOs or platforms and processing units and separating units. And then we will need pipelines to transport uh, that product to a market. Uh, uh, so some of these, uh, when the moment, uh, at, at the right time, there will need to be a decision on uh, if uh, the government is going to have a part on it, on, on, on the infrastructure that is going to be built for the transportation of the, uh, of the products, oil or gas. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah, and, and just building on that, um, and Eric previously referred to the map uh, where you see the infrastructure on the U.S. side versus the Mexican side, and you can see an abundance of installation and, and, and pipeline scattering system, etc. where in Mexico you have a lot concentrated just around Cantarel and that area. While for the new projects that will come, uh, you don't have that kind of, of infrastructure. And when it comes to should it be government or private sector, I think it has to be uh, that ecosystem that Eric talked about that developed that together. But I think it needs to be orchestrated by government because it's too big of an effort for any one company to undertake by its own. I think in Norway we have a good example on how the government uh, impulsed and in initiated the gas infrastructure uh, so that now we are producing around 50% of our production in Norway is from gas and we're able to evacuate that effectively through the system that has bil been built out. And I think that's a huge opportunity for Mexico in order to uh, make that gas economic and, and a great resource for the country. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we have here the screen telling us that the time is up. Uh, there is still a few questions left, but uh, we can definitely discuss them uh, afterwards. Uh, I want to thank once again to Monica, Evelyn, Eric, and Sergio uh, for, for your insightful comments and uh, excellent participation. And uh, I will pass it now on to uh, Faye or Jerome. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Mrs.